have about everybody that's going to join us today. It's a small group, which is good. I like the uh, impersonal or a very personal, you know, where we can talk and stuff about this. And it's a Q&A, so we can have open dis discussions. So um, I just want to introduce myself again. Um, hopefully you guys, some of you already know who we are, but uh, my name is Casey Harriet. I'm the R3 coordinator for the state of Oklahoma. I work for National Wild Turkey Federation as well. Um, and essentially R3 stands for recruitment, retention, and reactivation. And so I create programs and initiatives that keep people out hunting or get them out in the field hunting. So, um, and this is my husband, Jacob Harriet, and he is the Lincoln County Game Warden. And um, just a little background, we process a lot of deer every year. Um, we end up shooting about six to eight deer a year. Um, and, uh, we donate a lot of it too, but it's plenty that we basically don't eat anything other than deer for red meat. We <laughs> so, eat six or eight a year if we donate any, it's on top of that. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's, we don't buy beef. So anyways, what I kind of wanted to structure this like is I created a video, um, last year I kind of tried to record us breaking down to like a part two of our processing of our because we did a YouTube live of skinning and quartering our deer. Um, so you can go back on uh, our Outdoor Oklahoma face or YouTube account and find that one as like a good base or foundation for this next step. But really um, without, it's hard to do these things um, to where we couldn't like process a deer all right in front of you on, on a live like this. However, um, I created a video where I tried to go in depth and Jacob did a really good job demonstrating um, kind of how we break it down. And this is, there's multiple ways to do this. This is just our own preference. And this is from kind of perfecting it over time and just finding out what works for us and our family and what we prefer to eat a lot of. So um, we're just going to, I'm going to show this video. It's about 10 minutes long. And I do apologize when I tried to do a voiceover. I'm not super tech savvy on creating videos and stuff. So when I did a voiceover, it's, it's a lot louder, but it's only for like, I think 30 seconds. So bear with me. You might, it might shock you a little bit because it shocked me too. And I played it back after I uploaded it. So I'm going to get started on this and then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. We can talk about things. We can discuss things. I like to hear other people's processing techniques and what they like to do and what type of cuts of meat they like to eat. So just really want this to be informal and just chatting away. So uh, I am going to share my screen now. And I did, um, I had to look in to make sure I can get the audio working on this because it's kind of difficult. So, okay, optimize video clip and share sound. Okay. And uh, I did my best. It might get a little laggy on some of the time lapse, but just bear with us there. There's only a few time lapses and it, um, the frames might just get a little lagged up, but I'm gonna, we're gonna see what we can do here. And this should work. So it's a great freeze frame. That's, <laughs> That's our life. <laughs> okay. I am going to play it now. And then um, if you guys can maybe type in the chat box that you can hear this, like I, I would greatly appreciate it. Make sure this is working because I did a lot of back end work to hopefully make this work. So Hello, I'm Casey Harriet. I'm the R3 coordinator for the state of Oklahoma and National Wild Turkey Federation. And here with me, I have my husband, Jacob Harriet, Lincoln County Game Warden. And today we are going to be doing a part two of our deer processing series. The first episode was a YouTube live where we did a live demonstration of skinning and quartering our deer. So this would be step two to that process. And this is just our process. This is how we prefer to do it. There's many ways too. So this is not the end all be all, but um, this is just the way we prefer. So today we're going to break some deer down from the quarters. We're going to debone them and we're going to show you our preferred cuts and how we like to organize our meat. We're going to go through some steaks, uh, roasts, cube meats, fajitas, and some ground meat and sausage. So let's get started. Okay guys, so we're going to start off with our hind quarter. Uh, this is the biggest hunk of meat on the deer that we'll get off. Uh, so these are notorious for kind of getting dirty uh, in the field when you gut them and stuff. You expose this meat. So the first thing we have to do with these is uh, we want to get all the silver skin off. And the silver skin is just kind of this whitish coating that's all over the meat here. So we're going to get that off and usually by removing that you're going to get rid of any dirt or hair or anything like that that would be on the meat. So I'm going to go ahead and move that now. So that just kind of comes off in a sheet. And if you just kind of hold your knife angle up and away from the meat towards the silver skin, it usually comes off really, really easy. And we're basically just cover, cutting off all the nasty stuff. This is, holds a lot of the gamey flavor. It's really tough. And we'll just kind of do this on both sides, throw our scrap in our scrap pile. 
And like I said, we'll just come right back in it here. And just just holding that knife blade up works really, really well. And you can get a lot of that just cut real clean off and not waste any meat while you're doing it. Okay, guys, um, we forgot to mention that um, we quartered this deer up about a week ago, and it's been on ice in a cooler uh, for a week. So we go in every couple of days, make sure, switch out the ice on it. Every let day. all that every day every day and switch out the ice on that and let that bloody water kind of drain out helps kind of remove a little of the gamey taste to it um, and now we brought it in to uh, break it down even further and put it in the freezer okay guys so this is kind of what we want it to look like we got all that silver skin off any sort of dirt hair or nasty stuff is off the meat now besides that one piece of hair uh, but this is kind of the point you want to make sure it's clean it looks good and now uh, you can do it anyway you can really just start taking chunks off of it. When I do it, I normally like to break it down to the different muscle groups. It just kind of helps me see what I got and be a little more organized with it. That's what I like to do. And really at this point, it's pretty easy to separate those muscle groups. Uh, all the muscle groups are kind of bound together and then there's just like slits. Like you can see, this is a muscle group right here. So I can really just take my hand and kind of work in there. And then you can just kind of peel and carve it off. So I have this and I'm just going to peel this off and work it off in these different muscle groups. And there's going to be silver skin surrounding each one of the muscles. So after we did this generic, you know, clean up the whole quarter of what we could with silver skin, we'll get these separated out and we'll do the same thing on the back sides of the muscles that we couldn't get to. Okay, so now we have all our different uh, muscle groups broke down off the bone. So now, like you can see, this exposed a lot of the silver skin that we couldn't reach before. So I'm going to go in and clean all that up, and then we're going to go in and kind of break down the different parts and how we use them. Um, like this, this is just the round. This round is wrapped around a couple other muscles in here, so there's a lot of silver skin inside there. To me, it's not worth going in there and fighting all that silver skin, so I'll usually cube this up, and it makes great stew meats. Any sort of slow cooking is really good. Uh, now these bigger pieces here, they, uh, they're great for everything. There's not a lot of uh, sinew or, or silver skin on them at all. Uh, it's very wide grain. So with the grain of your meat, you can see all these muscle grains are running this way. So if you take that and slice it against the grain, it makes the meat extremely tender. So you can do steaks, you can do roast. I usually do fajitas out of them. Uh, you can really do just about anything. It's a really good, high quality piece of meat. Same with this muscle, this muscle, and this muscle. Now you get into the smaller ones. Usually what I'll do is I'll cut fajitas or stew meat out of what I can. Uh, you can also make steaks out of them, but there's a lot of skill, silver skin, especially in these calf muscles. Those will be slow cooked. Everything else, I'll just kind of clean up, get the nasty parts off. The scrap will either go to grind or jerky, whatever I decide to do with them. Go. Okay, we got all our uh, hindquarter broke down and cleaned up. Uh, different muscles are better for different cuts. So this muscle, very big, long grain. You can very obviously see it. Uh, today, I'm going to make fajitas out of this. You can make anything, steaks, jerky, stew, anything you want. This is a great piece of meat, uh, but I'm going to make fajitas today. So I'm just going to come in here, get my uh, thickness of my fajita meat I want, and just slice down. Uh, I'm just going to, yeah, and we're, we're cutting the grain on that. And just make them whatever size you want. That's about the size I like. That's good fajita meat. And we'll just do the whole thing like that. Okay, so these cuts of meat, uh, they got a lot of s silver skin inside them. They're multi-layered. It's like the calf and the round. Uh, usually what I do with this is anything that's slow cooked. So normally I just leave them whole and I'll put them in a Ziploc or a freezer bag and I'll just cut them, use them as a stew or make like barbecue sandwiches or something in the crock pot. Uh, today I think I'm actually going to cube them into stew meat. I'm going to do that with both these muscles. Uh, this muscle here is a good muscle. There's no tendons in it, but size wise, it's hard to make steaks. You can definitely do it, but I'm just going to go ahead and cube all that up into stew meat. Another thing you can do for these uh, tendony cuts of meat, um, besides roast or stew meat cooked long and slow, is you can can it, and it really melts away all that tendon and fat. And it, you, it's not pretty, of course, but it's shelf stable for two years, and it is very, very, very tender. And it's a quick meal if you need it. Okay guys, now we're on the front shoulder. I've already went through and kind of cut off the nasty silver skin and some of the trauma. 
Uh, that's one thing to think about when you, people are shooting these with rifles. Usually there's a quite a bit of trauma around the shoulder area. Uh, you don't want to eat anything that's like that, any blood or hair or any bubbly kind of uh, anything with air in it, you don't want to eat. Uh, so I fought with this bone a lot. You can debone it and get meat off of it and it's very good. But my favorite thing to do now is I just break it into the joint. So I'll take the shank, the middle, and then the shoulder blade and I just make roasts out of it. So I'll take this part, that'll go in a bag and I'll store that as a roast. I'll take this part, that'll be a roast. And then the shanks I put together and you can do a slow cook, makes great stews and stuff like that. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm just gonna go ahead and break these down. Okay, so here we have the back strap, kind of the same process as everything else. The first thing we have to do is get all the silver skin out. Uh, after we get the silver skin out, it's kind of your personal preference. A lot of people will cut up steaks. They'll just cut it, you know, in sections or they'll cut it and then butterfly it. The way I like to do it is I just cut it into thirds and then when I get it out, I'll pull out, you know, two of the thirds out and then that'll be our meal. Uh, we'll either grill it, smoke it, or pan sear it and it's absolutely delicious. It's one of the more choice meats in the, in the deer, but I'm gonna go ahead and start working on the silver skin and we'll get it divided up. This is the tenderloin. So uh, this is one straight out of the cooler and this is one I've already worked on. So basically you just go in and you just clean up all the fat and any kind of nasty stuff on it. And uh, this is probably the most tender piece of meat in the deer, delicious. Uh, I usually just grill them whole. You can cut steaks into them, do whatever you want. But all I'm gonna do here is just kind of cut this fat and some of this trauma off of uh, the tenderloin. Everything else that is left, uh, the neck meat, some of the abdomen meat, and just basically everything that's left in the cooler, I just cube up and you can either uh, pressure can this, you can use it as stew meat in a slow cooker type situation, or you can just throw it in the grind pile. Uh, we're gonna throw this in the grind pile today. But that's it, we basically broke down the whole deer at this point. Uh, this is our Weston grinder. It is a middle of the road commercial grinder and it uh, is strong enough to process all the deer throughout the year that we do. We also use this grinder to make really good breakfast sausage and summer sausage with the deer that we grind up. This is our Cabela's vacuum sealer. It does the job just fine. We put all of our roasts, our tenderloins, our back straps, any of our cubes, stew, meat, or fajitas, meat in these, and then we throw them in the freezer. Okay, well, there you have it. This is a mature dough broke down into uh, shoulder roast, tenderloin, stew meat, fajita meat, back strap, and a couple probably about eight to ten pounds of ground meat here we still have a little bit of sausage we're going to do afterwards but other than that this is essentially how we break down our deer here yep easy enough lots of food especially with meat prices being so high it's a great resource we have absolutely and we like to use all the animal all right thank you guys for watching okay so how was that did you guys see that all right it wasn't too loud at the end You guys are all muted too. So if you guys have any questions, now is the time we can start talking about anything and everything. We can make an open discussion, how you guys like to do it. Um, if any other questions you guys might have. I, I thought it was good. And I've all, I had a question on the ice chest storage. So can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So when you, when you put it in an ice chest, what is the benefit of that? And then how long, is too long. I know y'all said, I think y'all had it five days. Is, is, is shorter? What, if you don't do it as long, what is, what happens? And if you do it too long, what happens? It's so, it's kind of just, you know, if you say you took a deer or a cow to the processor, well, they're going to dry age that thing. And, and basically what you're doing is you're letting that meat break down in a controlled environment and that, uh, that adds flavor and tender. Uh, so, Ideally, normally when I shoot deer, I'm kind of grocery shopping, so I'll actually wait until we get a cold front, and I'll say I'll I'll go out and I'll shoot two or three does, and I, if it's cold enough, I let them hang out, and let, that's called dry aging, but in Oklahoma, it's so hot, a lot of times you have to do what's called wet aging, which is in that cooler. Uh, as long as you keep ice in it, you drain that water out, you know, you lose a lot of blood out of that water uh, doing that, but as long as you keep ice on it, it's good. Uh, keep it in the shade. You don't want that cooler in sunlight, but 
I mean, I'll do it up to 10 days or so, and I've never had any problems with that. But uh, the benefit is just flavor and tenderness. I think also, okay. yeah, it's, I think it, it removes a little bit of the gamey taste out of out of the meat. And also another technique people use is soaking it in milk. Um, but I have we have never done that. But that, that would be a lot of milk to have to go through and keep yeah. ice and milk on it. Um, yeah. But it is definitely an an option if you're really worried about your game eater. Yeah. Maybe a buck in, in rut or something like that would yeah. be one of those situations you would do that for. What even makes even... the what makes the gamey taste? Because I know I've ate deer that, that I've killed and and other people and it seems really good. But then I've ate like some hamburger meat or deer meat or ground beef venison and it had a gamey taste to it. Was would you think was that just not prepared right to have that gamey taste or so every person I've ever talked to that's had deer and not been happy with it, it's because of it just start as soon as you get that deer down, how you, what you do right from that point will change the flavor of that deer. So if you shoot that deer and it sits out and it's hot or you bust a gut and it gets some gut on it. Uh, I am very meticulous about removing that fat and silver skin. Your fat holds a ton of gamey flavor. Uh, deer fat is very waxy. You can actually make candles out of it. Uh, but removing all that fat and then that silver skin, uh, most of the time, if you take a deer to a processor, they're not going to remove that silver skin. They're just going to cut it up and that goes in the grind pile and their grind wow. will work through that. But me, I eat this and I, I, I'm very meticulous about it. So I make sure I get all that out. Uh, most people have to grind their meat a couple times, usually a, a coarse grind and a fine grind. I can do mine at once because I remove all that kind of junk out of it. Uh, I've heard people talk also about the, the deer is so lean that when they do the, the ground they'll add uh fat to it is that true or is that yeah do you we didn't work touch on that in the video yeah. yeah uh sometimes i will sometimes i won't it kind of depends on the fat i like to add very minimum fat so you know a lot of your butcher shops or your convenience stores even will have like just packages of fat it looks just like hamburger meat it's just pre-ground fat and you can mix that in i don't Very cheap too yeah it's dirt cheap i do not like to mix that over like five percent so, so you're looking like 95 five. Yeah. Uh, okay. Usually 3% is plenty. Uh, I don't mind the, just this, the regular deer meat, you know, without any fat mixed in it. One of the things you can get into is that meat doesn't have that fat, fat content. So it, it doesn't like, if you're wanting to make hamburger patties and stuff, it doesn't stick together as well. It's kind of more crumbly. And it's also like the benefit for cooking wise is it's a little less dry. Like when you have that fat, you get more oils in it. I prefer at least have five, 5% 5 fat in it only because I think it creates a better, I mean, that's about as lean as you can get from the store, right? Like a, a beef is yeah. like 95. So there's a reason why that fat's included in there. It just helps it to cook better and more flavor honestly and a, a lot more moist deer can kind of dry out because it's such a lean any sort of lean meat will dry out faster and so adding back that oil that moisture into it is is going to give it a little bit better flavor and that's because you're purposely removing all that deer fat from there you don't want to leave yeah. that deer fat some fat's good some fat's not when it comes to animals and deer fat is just not one of those good fats yeah what's your thoughts on the uh the cabela's um vacuum sealer because we normally just put ours like in ziploc bags and kind of press it out and you know we eat it pretty quick but is that does that give you a longer time in the freezer or does it give you something more beneficial i love that thing uh his parents had that and then so when we were going to purchase when we went in and purchased the same one because they've had theirs for a long time any sort of air you can remove out of that meat is going to give you a lot longer uh freezer life yeah it, uh, so I, before I, you know, was a game warden and stuff, I did a ton of deer, you know, we did bags, we did butcher paper, all that stuff. Well, then I went to college and I actually worked for like a beef butcher and I got very spoiled with that. He actually had, there's two different kinds, like that's just a tabletop that I have. Uh, they actually have a chamber vacuum sealer, which are, they're amazing. And I got very spoiled with him. Uh, th there's nothing wrong with doing the freezer bags and stuff, but it just, I, I feel like it aids a lot and the quality and longevity of that meat the uh, of and then also they're multi-purpose too so like if you open up a bag of chips you can put that bag of chips in that vacuum sealer and it'll seal it and keep them good like i mean you can use it a lot in a lot of ways not just meat uh so they're valuable i think that one was around 300 dollars. you can get them as cheap as 50 bucks or you know up to thousands of dollars if you want to but uh it's a good investment especially we do eight deer a year i mean that's a lot of food uh 
it pays it's paid for itself i think we also have a garden so we're freezing vegetables over the you know it it gets put to use and it'll uh dry vacuum like what you mentioned in wet vac too so either or and then there's also it has an option and i i think most you know decent uh vacuum sealers have that option but they have a cord that comes out like a little seal and you can plug it into like a uh container that you're like marinating steak or something in and Mm -hmm. it'll it'll suck all the air out of it so all that juice goes into the meat instead which is something we haven't used yet but i keep saying we're we should do that because that's a really cool feature that we just i think you have to buy a special like those little special container lids or something like that to have that uh pressure seal on it but they're pretty Mm -hmm. cool if you figure out how to use it yeah do you what's your opinion on i know uh wild pigs we've got some i'm I'm down in macomb pot county and uh on deer are they kind of the same way i mean i've heard people say if you kill a smaller pig it's better than like a big wild one but on deer itself is is a deer a deer i mean whether it's a a a young doe or a five-year-old buck or there's there's definitely a little bit of difference i think the process that i use or like what we just showed you on that video I don't think I could give you a, a steak, like a backstrap from an old buck and a backstrap from a young doe. I don't know that a person would really be able to tell that much difference. Okay. But I think with those older and bigger deer, the process matters a lot more. So that, you know, getting them cooled down in, in the ice chest or getting them, that will make a, a major difference. If you just take a, a mature deer, you cut some meat off of it and throw it on a fire and you just cut, took a, a young doe and threw it, there would be a huge difference, I think. But through that process, I mean, there's still probably some difference, but to me, it's not really like, I don't specifically label my bucks versus does because I think the does are better. It's all just kind of the same to me. You know, I, I can't like vouch for like what, what's fact and what's not, but when it comes to like cows and stuff, the younger, the better too. And I would think overall, it would be a little bit more tender um, I don't think it would be anything to deter me from not eating a big old buck, but um, I think I think they're probably quality wise. Just younger meat is probably yeah. a little bit more okay. there. Yeah. Um, now on pigs. Yeah. I would be. I would. I don't want to eat a 400 pound boar pig. Uh, you know those little 50, 60 pounders. I'll eat those all day long. But those, and mainly just because they get so nasty on the outside. You know, they they just. I mean, they're they're kind of rough animals. You know, they stink. They get lice real bad. More chances for them to pick yeah. up something gross. And, yeah, and they carry a lot of disease and stuff. I I wouldn't mess with eating a big pig like that. Not saying it's not good and it wouldn't be good, but if I had if I was hungry and I had to go shoot a group of pigs, I'd shoot the little one before I shot the big one. Okay. Yeah. And also, kind of when we're talking about the gaminess, um, I think another factor is how stressed was that animal when he when he died, he or she died. Uh, you know, if they have all sorts of stress hormones running through their body because they didn't die a pleasant death, um, that could definitely affect the quality of meat too. Absolutely. That'll man, if, if you, you know, get a deer and it's a poor shot and you jump and it runs a long ways, those things can be tough. They can have just a they can th- they just they kind of get a funky flavor to them. Yeah. Uh, so I and like I said, going through that process, it mitigates a lot of that, but there's still I mean, say you spine one and have to, you know, go out there and it's not, you know, the quickest death, there'd probably be a little bit of a difference compared to one that you just made a perfect shot on that went right down. Yeah. Don't let that deter you from obviously processing that. But if if yeah. you if you do have a bad experience with that, we I wanted to mention Hunters Against Hunger. Um, yeah. just this program that we have where you can there's processors that are um, set up all around the state that are part of this program where you can donate your meat if you're concerned with that and you're like oh this just doesn't this might not be worth my time if it's going to be really bad or whatever um, because they uh, if they'll, they'll take a healthy deer and process it and give it to food banks and whatnot so um, it's a it's a really good deal and I can send information out about that just if anybody would be interested and or if you have a lot of deer and you just want to shoot a bunch of deer and you love to hunt, you don't want to be out of the woods when your freezer's full, may as well just feed somebody else instead. So yeah, that program is awesome in mind. So so in my county, I got all these landowners that complain about deer, but they don't want anybody to hunt. And if they do get somebody to hunt, they they just want to shoot bucks. They don't want to shoot does because they don't want to mess with the doe. So that program, you can harvest a doe or a buck, donate it. The, and the state will pay that processor a hundred bucks. You give them a tip and all that meat goes to, you know, people that need it. It's a good program. But what about any truth on when you harvest a, a buck that you're supposed to cut the scent glands off pretty quick? Is that just a myth or is that 
any truth to that? I don't know about pretty quick, quick, but like you're talking the tarsal glands on the back leg. Yeah. So you definitely do not want that stuff touching your meat. That's why you take it off in yeah, case that, that's probably something. why. Okay. It smells. It just smells. You don't want them hanging it's with that. Rough. And it's same with gut. You know, if you pop a gut, you want to get that off the meat as soon as possible. Uh, those tenderloins, like I showed in the videos, they lay underneath the spine, you know, on the back side of the back straps. And those are notorious. If you pop a gut, it'll get a little bit on it and they will be twangy. I don't care what you do to it. If it gets yeah. gut material on it, it'll be twangy. But same thing with those glands. I mean, as long as they don't touch the meat, I don't think you ever have any, have any problems. And, you know, there's some other glands inside, like that hindquarter has two glands on each, or one gland on each side that I always remove. But it's it's pretty easy to do when you break those muscles down. But I wouldn't, like, want to cut that and rub it all over the meat by any means. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions, boys, over there? I thought maybe you had unmuted yourself a second ago. I kind of muted you back so because we, we were getting some interference. We got a group of homeschoolers here that this is their class for the day. So I'm waiting to see them hordes. Yeah, no I know. <laughs> I would be interested if y'all do these regularly. I just popped on the, the app yesterday and saw it and uh, did it. But I'd be curious. I know you said you smoke and grill and, and some of the meat that you did on your back straps. I'd be curious to see how you do them and what process at some point if y'all do okay. another show. So. Yeah, that, yeah, that'd be super easy to do. We I made backstrap last night, and man, you can't put a T-bone steak in front of me that's any better than that backstrap. It's so good. It's true. My my he, toddler, or I guess he's kind of a toddler. He just eats it like candy. I mean, it just melts in your mouth. It's so good. Yeah. Did you grill it or? This is the coolest technique we've found for that seems the most simple, and you it's it's a stove and a uh, oven combo and a cast iron. So you can yeah. tell them the process. Basically you take a skillet, get it as hot as you can, put butter in the bottom of it. Slap that back. And I, I leave my back straps in like third sections. So each back, like each back strap there. makes three sections and I just pan sear it on each side. So four sides, they're on there for maybe a minute. I mean, that pan is smoking hot. It'll smoke your house up a little bit, but each side, make sure it gets a good crust on it cut up a, a little more sticks of butter, put it in there. I just use a Montreal steak seasoning and then I stick it in the oven for like five minutes. Like 450. 450. Yeah. And then you get it out, temp check it. As long as it's around the 120 mark, I'll pull it out because it continues to cook a little bit in that pan. And man, it's just, it's melting your mouth. When I go to work and work late nights and stuff, I literally just take a section of that back strap and it's so tender. You just bite it off. It's I mean, cold. you don't have to, you don't need a knife. Wow. Yeah. I eat it cold. You don't even need a knife. And that's nice when it's super hot outside and you don't want to be outside smoking or grilling. It's a really cool option. And it honestly, I feel like that that's probably the best flavor yeah, we have. What we do is good. we'll cut up the we'll keep the skillet in front of us and we cut up the meat and we dip it in the bottom of the skillet and all those juices with the mm -hmm. burnt butter. It's so good. It's our favorite way. And the same with the tenderloins. I had somebody grill some one time and it, it just seemed tough, like there was no, it dried out really yeah. bad. And I found just through my own experience, and I don't know if there's any science to this or not, if I take those back straps and I cut them into like, you know, small steaks or I butterfly them out, they would dry up a lot more than if I just leave it in that third section. Yeah. Uh, that for whatever reason, being in that one piece, it just, it holds a lot of that moisture and stuff in there. Just less surface area that you're losing moisture from. Yeah, and I think also if we were to cover up the the cast iron in foil and put it in the oven, that would be another way to hold moisture in too. Yeah, but, We've just never had to do that because it's always been so juicy and tender. And um, what temp in the oven do you do it at? Four fifty. Sorry, four fifty. Four fifty. Yeah, and it's really you just pop it in there short term. You get it as hot as yeah. you can, like, and it, it's it's in the oven five minutes. I mean that that's it. Usually, that's so quick. yeah, when you do those. Uh, those back straps, you know, one is all the top of it is always bigger than the smaller ones. So a lot of times, like I'll temp check it and say, usually after five, after five six minutes, I'm at temperature with those smaller steaks. I'll pull those off, put them in a plate on a plate, and I'll stick those bigger ones back into it. Hits that like 120 mark, and then I put everything back in the pan, and they cook a little bit more after, you know, because that that cast iron is still very hot. Yeah. But the first one I had back strap, I think um, they. I think my dad made it for me a long time ago. We cross, we just cut them into little steaks and he hammered it out and then breaded it and, and fried it. And that was the, that's honestly, that's like the old school way of yeah. eating backstrap. Like that's the only way I've ate it. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. So when you said that, I was like, okay, I need more information. So yeah, yeah, and they're great fried like that. We try not yeah. to get a ton of fried right. food, you know, though. But man, it's it's hard to beat. And I do them on the grill too. Before. You know, we've just been doing it at Skillet probably the last two or three years. Before that, I grilled them, and they still turn out great. I mean, that's same thing. Get it super hot on that grill, sear it on every side. Uh, so on the grill, and I don't understand the exact process, but when you put them on there, there's a brief point in time where that meat will weld to the grill, and it's, like, hard to flip. If you go to flip it and it's stuck on there, don't flip it. Leave it on there until it naturally cooks off, and then you can flip it over, and that does a lot of good for whatever reason. I don't understand it, but – it, it works. Yeah, it works. <laughs> what about your ground your ground? Can you cook it as a hamburger or do you just use it like more for spaghetti and stuff? Oh gosh, I use it for everything. Yeah. I put it in soups, I put it in stuffed peppers. I do we don't really even do hamburgers, which no. we, we've made them before. So but... it uh it's still it's so lean, it still has a little bit of trouble sticking together. So usually if I do hamburgers, I will finally cut up like some onions or peppers or even add some breadcrumbs to it. And that'll just, yeah, you can add an egg to it and it'll just help that patty stick together. Cause you know, deer meat's notorious for crumbling. If you make patties out of it, uh, we don't do a ton of hamburgers just cause we don't eat a ton of hamburgers, but yeah. man, we make chili, you know, hamburger chili. meat, tacos, everything out of it. Yeah. And I love the fajita meat you know how we yeah. showed that cross section when you get a long piece that you can cross grain cut it like that, that stuff's so tender. Yeah. Um, that, and, and uh, I, we should mention, we don't marinate the backstrap or anything. No, I it's, mean, it's just, we we thaw it out and then put Montreal on it, let it rest for a little bit, and then we throw it in the skillet. Yeah, I literally take a bowl, I pull out my freezer packages, I let it thaw out till it gets thaw. I'll open those packages up, set them in the bowl. I get all the, you know, kind of the juice and stuff off of them so they're semi-dry. I put that seasoning on, they go straight. I put seasoning on one side, put them on that skillet, put the seasoning on the other side while they're in the skillet. I mean, it's no prep work. I made dinner last night in like 25 minutes. Yeah. I, I hate to jump off because this is very good, but I've got another one I got to run to. But thanks is good. And I look forward to some more of them. If you guys yeah, thank that. you for your questions. It was, it was, they were great questions. And uh, it's a small crowd today. So we wanted to have some, some questions to answer. We'll definitely talk about our processes of how to, um, how we sear and stuff. We might put another video together and then yeah, like just some meals that we come. How up do we with. find out? I just found it on the app yesterday. Is that kind of where you post up? Yeah. At? I think our next class, I'm going to post it today is muzzleloader um, class, but it's not anything to do with like food. It's just how to side in your muzzleloaders and typical okay. muzzleloader basics. And then we do have a foraging one that I'm um, going to figure out when, when the best time to schedule is. So that's kind of cool because you can make some mushroom, like morel mushroom gravy for over the top of your back straps or something. Yep. That'd be really good. Um, so we're going to get into a little bit more of the food side of things because we found that there's an interest in it. Okay. Thanks, guys. So thank you guys for joining us today. I hope you guys learned something uh, new about deer processing and maybe you'll give it a go. I just want to let you guys know that this is recorded so we can go back on our YouTube channel and watch it. And then also uh, keep keep checking back our outdoor calendar because we'll have new classes coming up. I believe our next class is muzzleloading class um, in two weeks or so. So um, go back on, that, on our outdoor calendar for that specific date. Uh, and we hope to see you guys there.